talented people. I hope you're feeling well and healthy. And welcome to the third series of Talent Talks. To all those of you who are joining us for the first time, we at Trending Topics started Talent Talks as a series of events that uh, had one rather ambitious goal. To demystify the myths about career growth, to demystify myths of, of what IT and uh, tech rock stars really want at the workplace. And also to demystify the sometimes rather complicated relationship between employees and their employers. Why? Well, if we spend one third of our life at work, it should be a bit more about uh, than just earning money, no? Mark Twain said that if you find a job that you enjoy doing, you will never work a day in your lifetime. And as some of us are lucky to find their hobby and to call it work and do it, many of us also struggle to finding our true vocation in the beginning. And still, it is never too late to make a U-turn and go on a different path. In fact, a lot of successful people have a zigzag career. And what makes them different? This is what we will be exploring today. And how do you know it is time to reinvent your career? Oh, I can talk long about this, but don't let me bore you, because tonight we have invited some really cool and exciting uh, professionals who will share their experience. The first one is uh, Otman Bumzibra. We will start with a short keynote by him, um, and uh, he will be sharing how he made his third or fourth U-turn in his career, which is very brave, of course due to COVID-related uh, circumstances. And he's currently um, the co-founder and a brand advisor of Ingotify, and uh, still running his business in exhibitions, Easy Exhibit. Otman, welcome. Join me. Rina, thank hey. you, thank yeah. you, thank you for the intro. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward for to the panel discussion later. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Otman Bunzeba. I'm going to share with you uh, my career switching uh, from uh, since I'm t 20, so I'm 40 now, so about 20 years. Um, very quickly, um, disclaimer, you don't have to do what I did. <laughs> I'm not having responsibility for that, but I hope that you can there are some takeaways uh, from this presentation. I will start first with um, this quote. Fear is temporary, regret is forever. So that's the, uh, the tempo I would like to give here, is that switching career is scary, but we need to keep in mind that this fear has utility and is there for short time, it will go away. But regretting not taking a decision, that's something that could stay with you forever. So let's see how we can go through with this. So very little um, little uh, snapshot here about um, th this presentation mainly will speak to professionals if you have at least two to three years experience and um, if you are right now at a critical career uh, uh, career intersection. So uh, just to share with you, for you to have some context, I will speak a little bit more, I will tell you more about me, I will share with you what I think about career switch what's career switch, how, how, uh, how I read it, uh, five lessons that I learned from career switching, and a couple of final thoughts. So about me, my name is Otman Boomzebra. I'm a citizen from Morocco and France. I'm founder of Embedcom Engineering and co-founder of Easy Exhibit at Ingo and Ingotify. I lived in different places. I put the spots there on the map, mainly in Europe. And I switched during my career switching, I moved also from employee to independent to entrepreneur. Um, recently, the main change that happened was from the business to business trade show industry, uh, which is uh, my main activity for the past 10 years through Easy Exhibit, moving towards the marketing and currently in strategy, helping companies with their strategy. So I put here just a snapshot of the past 20 years. If you take a picture of me 20 years ago, I was selling donuts at the beach. So that was a great experience. From every experience I'm putting here, I learned some things. Um, then later on, I started um, to work as an engineer, and I started in the aerospace industry as an avionics software engineer. And 10 years later, I moved to Bulgaria, where I created my company, Easy Exhibit, uh, where I was the CEO, and still until today. Uh, as you know, with COVID and the pandemic, all the events have been, have been hit. 
And right now, we are helping our clients and new businesses with how to rethink their brand strategy. Uh, they cost, I mean, so many things have changed, and it's time to make a little pause and help uh, companies strategize about that. So that's typically in a snapshot about me. So career switch, I will just use very specific um, basic steps. Let's go back to the definition. So a career is an occupation undertaken for a significant period of a person's life and with opportunities for progress. And I love this last part about it. And switching, <laughs> I know it's simple, <laughs> but switching is an act of changing or adopting one thing in the place of another. So I'm not speaking here about how I switch career with somebody else. This is just me, okay? So why, what gets us to switch career? And typically there are two, mm, two driving forces. Either it's forced on us, and in that case, it's external circumstances. It could be the studies that we have chosen. It could be the market conditions. It could be our parents. We have to know what are those external driving forces forcing us to such choices. It could be um, a life event or, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody from your team is a leader and he's leaving and you're charged. So he didn't choose that career, but now you're in charge. So this is the main uh, one of the, the driving forces. And the other one is intentional, which is coming from an internal source where you made the decision to make that move. And in such case, typically happens um, for pushed by negative emotions, like uh, out of a burnout or reaching a plateau or glass ceiling where you see you cannot go beyond, uh, or simply some ambition that is deep there boiling that wanted to express and now maybe you reach the level of maturity, the level of uh, awareness that you needed to go with your, uh, to, take, uh, to make the move. So these are typically the two areas to look at. Now there are different directions and different ways you can compose your, um, your career switch if we're speaking about switching careers. It typically is the nature of the activity. So one of the, this means, for example, between marketing and engineering. And for me, for example, from engineering to marketing. Uh, it could be from uh, uh, legal department to, <laughs> to uh, uh, software. Um, there's the second part, which is more about the responsibility and the level of responsibility you want to have. And there you, you have to look at beyond just be having it, uh, being responsible for a team. It could be also working for yourself as a self-employed. Then you're responsible for yourself only and not for nobody else. Uh, you can decide to be an investor and not to have any responsibility in operations and just a wait for a return on investment. And uh, what I call, this is recent, I call this, um, uh, I, I don't call this, I have to credit uh, Jonathan Stark who speak, spoke about um, altitude of involvement. And this is the different, becoming aware of the different level of value that we deliver to a client, to uh, our boss or, or comp on employer. And this typically three levels, we have uh, the service and maintenance level. This is typically where you're the hands, you're doing the work. Uh, then you have the implementation level, where you have an expertise that is valuable and that can help implement things and uh, do a very specific uh, job. And uh, the last one, uh, the highest one, which is strategy, where you help uh, your customers, um, your team to come up with a strategy. So you have to take that into consideration. Typically, your direction will be a component of one of or all of these parameters. Now. Just to come to the lessons I've learned, and there are five of them. Of course, actually there are hundreds of them, but I just try to compile them to five. The number one is be healthy. Now this sounds really easy, but if we are going through a career change, the number one resource you're going to need is that your body doesn't fail you along the way. So uh, when the pandemic hit, I set up myself on a course that was started in July. I lost 13 kilograms because I knew I need the energy. I need to feel uh, energized uh, throughout the whole journey. There will be challenges uh, and we cannot afford that. So typically what it means to be healthy is um, becoming really aware of the nutrition. This is so important. Um, this is something I was unaware of and uh, I start to see the value of it today. Um, exercise and sleep. I mean, it's very important to sleep. So that's, um, these are the three of them. And actually healthy is, is um, once you have it, you don't realize, but once you lose it, you understand the value of it. So this is the number one thing. Second one is uh, knowing yourself. And this is so, this is a deep topic. You have to go deep down. 
you got to know what drives you, what motivates you, what also drains you. You have there are some activities and some uh, events, relationship, interactions, setting that drains the energy out of you. You need to be aware of that so that you avoid those type of activities. You also need to know what energizes you, what uh, type of work or what type of uh, uh, setting will keep keep your juice juices running. Um, uh, so important topic. I mean, uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin that says there are three things hard in life: diamond, steel, and knowing oneself. Maintain momentum. When you do a switch of career, there is a moment where you would be floating, and you want to make sure that once you started on, ta on that next um, opportunity or the next next job, that you are you are already running. So um, if you have the opportunity, if you are forced and you had to uh, switch uh, very quickly, that's one thing. But if you can and if you have some time, use that time in advance to get ready because this is something new and you cannot afford to be learning when you start the job. So that's something that uh, I think is important. Maintaining momentum also in the relationships. You want to, you know, you develop a relationship, people, friends, you have to maintain that network. So momentum in any sense. So the only thing that you have to consider is don't do anything that is going to block you along the way. Lesson number four, decipher your fears. Wow, this is, uh, so what it means is that whenever you're going to do something scary, <laughs> your brain is going to send you pictures of uh, different version of you dying. All right, so it feels like that. So the body cannot make, all body is there to help us survive. So of course, if we're going to doing something that is highly, highly risky, it's going to send us pictures to uh, help us survive through that. So we need to be able to resonate with that and go beyond that fear because that's what's blocking us for the next steps. And it could haunt us along the way if we don't deal with it. And lastly, and the one of the most important ones is align your relationships, meaning uh, you have a partner in life, make sure she's on board or he's on board, make sure they understand what you're trying to do. And also consider if you have a responsibility as children, you cannot just make any kind of career switch. Um, it's very important because those people are going to be the, um, the supporting cast in hard moments and you need those people with you. So uh, big up to my wife. <laughs> life partner and business partner, uh, Zaza, and uh, for that. And it's, it, this is so crucial. It also means the ring of friends you have. When you change career, you've got to change your environment. You have to rethink with who you want to be surrounded that is going to help you in that journey. You've got to consider that. It doesn't mean you have to break up with friends, but it means you've got to be more intentional about who you want to hang out with. Uh, that's for the five lessons. Actually, I have 100, we can talk about it after. But typically, what, how I see a career is, I see a career as a dynamic journey. It's not a straight path line, um, as sometimes we are taught. There are different paths that will get us to our destination. And when we have, at, in this uh, journey, sometimes we'll be facing challenges, and we just got to make sure uh, that we can uh, assess what we have ahead of us and the opportunity also behind it, but we don't just simply jump into it. There are considerations that we have to do so we don't overstretch. We have to develop, as I mentioned earlier, some self-awareness. And um, what I suggest and my, my takeaway from if you're doing a career switch, um, it's like what you do before any long journey into the unknown. You want to make sure your tank is full. So pause if you can. Refill, relax, have a bit of space, and then go back a little bit to be able to jump, and you make it. Now, once you jump, and once you make a decision, make sure you stick with it for a while, because you'll be tested, and your resolve will be tested. Now, it doesn't mean you have to be stubborn about it, but it will be tested, and you want to make sure to maintain that momentum you just built. You made a big decision. So I want to leave you with a thought. In 10 years, what do you want the future self, your future self, to tell you about the decision you're making today? I've chosen mine. I'm saying thanks to my 10 years old self for making decisions when I made at 30 to make this switch to come to Bulgaria and to go through an entrepreneurial journey that get me to discover unbelievable things about myself. I'm absolutely glad that I made that decision. So 
thank you for your attention. One last thing, I have a little gift for you. So for the first five people that send me an email, at this email at otman.boom at gmail.com. Um, with the subject career switch, um, I will get you an exclusive self-assessment uh, that comes with a report that will show you what drives you, what motivates you. And it's really fun, it's really cool, it's online, takes only 15 minutes. I'll be happy to give you that for free, for the five, first five. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Osman. That was cool. Hey, Thank you. next time I hope that you will be sharing with us the lessons that you have learned as a donut seller on the beach. <laughs> because that is a quite exciting story. There is a lot to learn. Um, so before we continue, um, I would like to invite you and to encourage you to um, send us your questions. You can do that at me. Oops. The clicker is not playing with me right now. Ah, so it's working. Yes, you can ask your questions on Slido um, with this event called Talent Talks, or you can just uh, scan the QR code. You can also put them on Facebook if you're watching us live on Facebook. My colleagues, we will be following them, and uh, I will ask them to the audience at the end. Today is Men's International, uh, oh, I'm sorry, today is the International Men's Day. So I decided I'm going to introduce our next speakers the other way around, first the man and then the lady. To the stage, I would like to invite now Christo Dimitrov, who graduated law from the Sofia University, please come here back in 2015, but after working as an employee in a, in a law firm for a couple of years, he realized that this is not his vocation. He wanted to do something related to data. So he started first as a data processing executive in market research, followed by a date, data scientist internship, and now he is currently in the position of a database migration engineer at Docomaster. The next speaker is Alex Sumin, who is the co-founder and CMO of Claim Compass a travel tech startup helping travelers to get paid when airlines screw up, which today uh, has successfully recovered from the COVID uh, <laughs> situation. Alex worked for an airline based in Montreal, a PR agency in Berlin. Um, he spent also some time working at the federal government of Canada in tax and bankruptcy divisions. Uh, prior to that, he studied accounting and political econ economy. The third speaker is Dr. Svetlin Nakov, <laughs> and he is a passionate software engineer, inspirational technical trainer, and a tech entrepreneur with 20 years of uh, experience in a broad range of programming languages, software technologies, and platform. He is a speaker of hundreds of events and a prolific author of 12 tech books, a trainer of 500,000 tech students in software engineering and digital skills. Svetlin is also the co-founder uh, of several highly successful tech startups and non-profit organizations. Currently, he is innovation and inspiration manager at Softony. Please come to the stage. Last but not least, here with us, uh, physically remote but not emotionally, uh, is Tiliana Biandova. She graduated civil engineering, but there was a huge but, because she wasn't happy with her job, so she decided to change her career, and uh, she developed to a data and analytics engineer, now currently working at Musala Soft. Tiliana, I hope you can hear us. Hello. Hear me well? We're waiting for a sound in the... Yes, great. So welcome to all of you, some of you um, here in, this, um, in, the, in the room, Stiliana remotely. I think this will be working great, so let's see. Let's start with the questions. Um, my, quest my questions are kind of easy, so the tough ones are at the end coming from you, from the audience. And the first one goes to all of you. What did you dream of becoming when you were a kid? 
and are you happy with whom you become after that? Maybe we will start with Svetlin. I was dreaming uh, when I was a child to become a teacher and this is what happened. <laughs> a few years later I dreamed about becoming a construction engineer. This didn't happen still, but I believe it will happen later. And th the third, when I was a little bit uh, older, was to become a software engineer. And this happened first. <laughs> so next I switched to teacher. Now I combine teaching and uh, software engineering. And I believe someday <laughs> I'll be involved in constructions. <laughs> happen all these my <laughs> <laughs> dreams from the the past. So, okay, so all your dreams came true. Now you need to make up new ones, I think. I'm highly focused. Yeah. W I, I always try to do one thing and to be very good on it and not to, and I avoid to, to do many things in the same time. So, because I cannot be very good. Unless I just um, spend some time with friends, that this is different, but. Uh, in in a work situation, I always try to be highly proficient. Mm. Otherwise, I don't feel well. I feel like I'm not for this thing that I do. Mm. Oh, it's hard to imagine that you uh, maintain to keep focus with uh, all the stuff that you've been doing in the last years. It's but this is yeah. for for a lot of years because I, I started when I was a child. I, for example, I started programming uh, when uh, I was 11 years old. So I have a lot of coding experience, uh, which happened uh, when I was at school. Later, I w I become a teacher. Either at, at school. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I became a student, I was student, teacher, and software engineer in the same time in my students' year. So it, it happens. It happens. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the books, I have only one book which I wrote entirely alone. All of the others were one chapter for you, one chapter for you, one chapter for you, and I will give you the guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how it <laughs> This happens. is how it happens, okay. Alex, was your, what was your dream? Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, I think as a kid I wanted to become an artist or a painter. Um, luckily, I guess, uh, for a lack of any significant talent, I didn't <laughs> choose that path. Um, so... I guess there's um, that creative side kind of carried over a number of different things. So I definitely did not dream of becoming an accountant or a taxman. So you will be sharing about this one. I mean, I'm, I'm quite curious how it came to all of this. Christo? Uh, when I was a little kid, I had quite unusual dream of uh, having my own personal zoo. Uh, yeah, and uh, I was drawing schemes how the different species should be situated in this zoo and how to get animals from all over the world. But then I figured out that that's quite expensive project. So uh, in the end, it's <laughs> not whom I've become. But regarding uh, if I'm happy now, uh, yes, I I would say that uh, I feel happy and content with whom I've become. And though um, there is al always space to grow, to, to make new plans. And uh, recently I got a, a kitten, so uh, maybe it's not too late to start this so project mm -hmm. after all. <laughs> so you already have a the career change. <laughs> career change. Yes, yes. Stiliana, what was your dream? Hello, everyone. Well, when I was a little girl, I was dreaming to become a hairdresser. I love to make different hairstyles to all my dolls. I even give some of them a haircut, really terrible haircuts, but I give it a try. <laughs> And, uh, of course, nothing happened. I didn't even try to become a hairdresser when I grew up. Uh, later on, I dreamed of becoming an architect. Total disaster. You have to paint at least well. I cannot paint at all. So I gave up this too. Actually, I didn't... Uh, dream of becoming a civil engineer, but it was the closest to architect. It was at least connected with the buildings. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
actually i never 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 thought that uh, i will end up here working as a database developer nevertheless i think this is my best decision yet oh you sound happy happy to hear yes, that I am. <laughs> um christo you studied law yeah. but turned into a database migration in engineer uh, now you're um, thinking about big, uh, running your own zoo, which is interesting. Uh, how did it happen? What motivated you to make such a transformation? Well, it, it was kind of smooth transformation. Uh, I knew that I don't want to be part of the legal sector when I was uh, in my fourth year in the university. So there was this internal struggle and battle if I have to graduate. Uh, but after all, I've uh, managed to pass so many exams and uh, when I put these two things on the scale I decided that yes I should graduate and uh, looking back though these two sectors are very different uh, I could find some some elements that are help helping me for example in the university I've managed to learn how to handle a lot of information to get um, how to dig into details and uh, understand complex theories. But what motivated me? Well, um, I had a few years uh, legal practice and uh, having a good job wasn't just enough for me. Uh, I wanted to, to change m this field and uh, be part of something more innovative and uh, a sector that is in constant progress. And uh, that's why I decided to, to change my career path. And this is only one part of the, the uh, way how, how I become database uh, migration engineer, uh, because you have to put a lot of efforts. But on the other side, uh, if it's not for the employers uh, who are understanding and I had this amazing opportunity to be part of DocuMaster because um, I'm not the only one in the company that has um, uh, university background that is non-technical but uh, when you have companies like this uh, which give you opportunity and uh, believe in you that's how things change. Mm. Okay, so that was the supporting cast, as Otman said. Alex, as I was reading your resume on LinkedIn, I got the feeling that uh, you had a very different idea of uh, how you imagined your career in the beginning. Uh, you said it accounting, uh, then political economy, uh, you worked in the public sector, and then at the end you turned into an entrepreneur responsible for marketing and growth, right? Um, probably not just that. In a small team, you're responsible for everything. And still, how did it happen? And did you finally found your, uh, find your vocation? Um, I'm going to try to answer this <laughs> as, uh, as brief and concise as I can. Uh, I think I was mostly asleep uh, throughout my teen years, so I didn't really have any goals in terms of what was I going to do with my life and uh, what was I going to work and what was my career going to be like. Uh, so I was a really poor student up until university and the only reason why I decided to um, you know, do a, a bit more effort, put, put a little bit more into it is because there were some scholarships and some money involved. So that kind of excited me and, uh, and this was probably my very first life-changing decision um, when I tried to be more engaged. Um, and I began traveling, I did an exchange in a, co in a number of places and uh, that kind of triggered my world view of, you know, you can try different things and you can, um, you know, the worst that could happen is you're going to end up where you were before. Uh, so I, I, for better or for worse, I ended up studying political science and uh, this was actually prior to studying accounting. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So yeah. <laughs> As, a, as somebody who only landed political science, not that I'd w I wanted it, but this was the only thing that I could get into after you know, having such bad grades, um, I was going to pursue working in a public service because that's what you do, especially in, in Canada. So, um, so I ended up in a public service and everybody was telling me how this is an amazing opportunity and you know, you're very young, you have a great career, uh, this is a lifetime job and just this, a lifetime job sounded absolutely horrible for somebody who's in their early 20s. Um, so uh, I, real I quickly realized I, 
nevertheless spent about four years working for the government. Um, and it really wasn't a place that I wanted to be. And um, I had kind of taken advantage of some of the other, some of the perks that a stable job gives in Canada. And uh, this was, you know, taking credits and, and a mortgage and all that kind of stuff. So I tried uh, experimenting on the side with like solopreneur type of stuff, you know, uh, but nothing serious. And, um, uh, and at some point I just thought that, you know, the next thing would be to try to make something more uh, tangible um, and something more serious. So I met with some people, started expanding my circle, and, uh, you know, opportunities come from different walks of life. So um, I met some great people, some great co-founders, um, and we began working on this path. So uh, it's been a very hectic journey, unlike some of the other people here who had more or less of an idea of how they were going to go about life. Mine has been, uh, you know, a lot of different verticals uh, going simultaneously and then just picking the one that makes the most sense that, that, that's going to stick at a time. So, I can totally relate to that. It was pretty much the same with my career path. Um, Stiliana, uh, there are not so many women in civil, engineer, in civil engineering and um, also not many women in data analytics. But for sure there are much less women who are doing both or who can do both. How did you decide to pursue such a U-turn in your career? Well, for sure, there are not a lot of people with that background. Let me tell you something more about my life story. <laughs> um, as I said, I graduated as civil engineer. That was probably 10 years ago. And uh, even back there, when I graduated, I was not sure that I have made the right decision and that I have chosen the best career for me. But still, I was too young and I was scared to try something new. I was scared to disappoint my parents who have invested so much money for my education and uh, I have spent so much time for it. Uh, I cannot bear to throw away all these efforts, all this time and all this money. So I, I tried to give it to give a try actually and started working as a civil engineer. I thought, well, maybe when I studied it, it's not so interesting, but uh, working it, it will be. And it, it is, actually, it is interesting, but it's not for everyone. And definitely it was not for me. I have switched several companies, but um, mostly all of the time it was the same scenario. I did not like my job. The effort was too much. The workload was too much. The pressure was not too much, but huge. Uh, most of the time I was working all the time, uh, late in the night, in the weekends, in the holidays. It was very, very stressful and a very negative experience, actually. So uh, at first I thought, uh, well, maybe this is the situation in this company. I can try in a different one. Maybe it will be different. Uh, so I switched and switched companies, but uh, uh, unfortunately the situation is almost the same everywhere. And I can remember that uh, before I started my last job in a building company, I thought, well, if this time is not different, I will strongly consider changing my career. And so I started. I was disappointed at about three months later. And uh, this was the final drop in the glass that made my decision to change my career path. Of course, I explored some opportunities. And uh, by chance, by accident, or it was a God's will, I found a course that was for civil engineers who want to learn programming from the scratch. I thought, wow, that is just my profile. This is for me. So I started the course 
Of course, it was a basic fundamentals course, but uh, it uh, showed me that this is something that I really should consider as an opportunity. This was the trigger of the change. Uh, this was the first step of my career change, and I glad, I'm glad I did it. I, ne I have never regretted it, not even a day since then, maybe four years ago. So uh, this was the time that I changed my career. Uh, I'm still learning. I'm still training. Um, still more to learn. But I'm optimistic that this is the path and I will not switch it again. Thank you, Silena. Thank you very much. Um, I was thinking right now that uh, whenever I had a, a, a U-turn in my career, there was something like a sign blinking on you, telling you, hey, this is the, the path that you should be taking. It was similar like to you. I mean, you discover all of a sudden a, a, a course which is like by design made for you. And I had such situations previous several times already in my life. And each time I thought, that's a sign. I need to follow that. My life, you know, the universe is sending me a message. Um, so, Svetlou, uh, we just discovered that uh, you basically become what you have always been dreaming of. Um, but you also have a long year experience in training IT professionals, and I'm sure that uh, you have observed such uh, transformations with your students. Um, could anyone become an IT engineer or a software developer? And what um, is the most crucial skill one needs to develop and manage such transition? I believe that anyone who wants to try should try because people believe this is too complex or it requires too much math or it's not true it's true that it needs passion if you have a passion on computers like gaming if you play games for 24 hours without going to eat or uh, staying uh, up out of the chair it's a good sign that you have a uh, mm, some passion to, to follow something in the computer. So you just need to switch the context and replace the games with coding. <laughs> so this is how it happens even with me. Uh, in the beginning, I, was, I started uh, maybe 27 years ago or something like this. Uh, you don't need to be so yeah, precise, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it was just a place where we, we went for playing games and some of us uh, were trying to hack the games and we needed to write code because, uh, for example, you open, you save the state of the game, you open the file, edit the values, for example, how much money you have, change and save it. So this was in the very beginning. Uh, later it became more complicated because game producers tried to put protections on the games, so it was very interesting. So I believe that young, young people should find something which is good for them, something where they have passion. So they need to try. For example, um, if you need to be a sportsman, you should put all your efforts there. You should not become an uh, accountant, for example. If I want to work, uh, if I need to work as an accountant, maybe I will emigrate and, uh, or will kill myself. <laughs> I, I, there are some f professions that are not for me and I feel this internally. I believe most people are the same, but with different professions. So people should try what they want. Uh, what th they, they should try many things and until they find what is designed for them in this life. And for IT, you should try first and uh, you should uh, feel yourself whether you like coding, where you like uh, sitting a wonk for a wonk uh, in front of the computer, where you... Mm, how, how to say, it, it's a combination of some kind of skills and some kinds of behavior. It takes time. Uh, 
mm. because if you want to to become just a seller at, at the at the local shop you just go and start <laughs> Whether you will become a good seller or not depends on your talent, but you can do this job. With programming and IT professions, it's not like this. You need to put a lot of effort. Maybe only in, medi in medicine and few other specialties, you need to be put more effort than in, in IT. And for the IT, you need to put at least two years of what of coding every day or maybe five years to become good. To, to start a job, two years are enough. To become a good, five years are enough. To become exceptional, if you don't sleep these five years, <laughs> it could be. <laughs> Some people never reach the exceptional level of uh, their profession because they don't have this internal passion to, to learn how things work internally, to go beyond uh, what their boss expects. Because I always try to find how this works. When I b came into this building, the first thing I did was, wow, how many cameras, how does this work? Did you mention, I, I thought with the local engineers here to ask them what software they use. And because I learn every day, and this is in my internal passion to learn how the things do. It, even the IT industry was not well paid, I still w will be there mm. because this is my passion. And I want people to find their passion and to follow it. If this passion is related to IT, this is great because they will be happy, they will be rich, they will be not rich, but uh, good in a good financial condition. But if they feel this is not for them, they should go somewhere else. Okay, so passion, time, effort. Um, persistence. Yeah, persistence. Very good. What did you need to, uh, to get out of your comfort zone and uh, to switch your career? Christo? I would add that you should be courageous and um, be willing to, to take some risks because after all, switching from one career path to another is kind of a big risk and uh, it's important to know when to make this decisive step and uh, think about uh, the balance between the um, comfort zone and uh, the spontaneity and uh, another thing that one should have uh, in mind is that probably uh, once we encounter um, kind of bad stigma of a new of a newcomer in a completely different sector. And this is uh, not only in the recruitment process, but uh, in the um, initial process of uh, entering the company. What I mean by this is I've been looking to, to be part of companies that are open-minded, as I said. Oh, I mean. But, uh, for example, I have, uh, we mentioned accountants a few minutes ago. I have a, my, a friend of mine who is accountant and uh, she was in this sector for 10 years and she was trying to get a job in the data industry. Uh, but after having so much experiences in, a, in another sector, uh, some of the recruiters decided for herself and said, uh, you, this is a completely new beginning for you and we don't think you put so much passion and um, efforts to, to make your new career from the very beginning and it was kind of, kind of unfair uh, and she's still struggling to find mm. a new job and uh, you should only ha also have flexibility and mental agility I think to, f to stay focused on the tasks you, you want to achieve and uh, it's quite important to have uh, family and friends who will encourage you because uh, this extra strength that are coming from them, it's, it's great. Okay, you, I mean, you're making it sound uh, kind of scary. So courage, you need to be able to take, uh, take risks, uh, be flexible, um, have the support of your relationships. Uh, did I miss something? Mental, oh, yeah. mental health or mental... Agility. Yeah, mental power, let's put mm. it like this. Uh, Stiliana, Alex, do you have something to add? I mean, it's w almost 10 things that you need before you do a, a U-turn. 
I would like to share, I think, uh, that you need courage not only to risk. Uh, I needed courage only uh, because uh, I was afraid that I will fail. I believe uh, most people have it too, that uh, they are afraid that uh, they will start something, they will not complete it, they will fail, uh, and uh, they will be kind of um, embarrassed or ashamed. So it's not just uh, the risk, uh, but uh, the risk of failure. And this is one of the things I was also very afraid of. Uh, the risk of disappointing your relatives and closest friends is still relevant for me. I don't know if it's for other people, but it is really, really important to have uh, in your closest friends and your family to support you. Because sometimes when you're discouraged and you want to give up, you need just a little push from your uh, relatives and your family, just a little push to step one uh, to step further and to continue. Thank you. That was a nice uh, remark, but also the fear of failure. Yes, we talked about the uh, fears. That's quite a common fear. I remember back then that one, when someone asked me, hey, what is the worst thing that can happen to you if you fail? And then I realized it's almost nothing. I can deal with that. This is what gave me the start to initiate my first company, which failed, by the way, but it wasn't that tragic. Um, so in her book, uh, Angela Duckworth, uh, which is called The Grit, describes that talent is uh, overrated. And she states that uh, uh, success is more often than not the result of focused perseverance, something that uh, Svetlo mentioned before that. Um, so let's say that you agree with this sentence, but can you tell me a bit more, how did you feel this, uh, this uh, need of putting perseverance, uh, perseverance when, you, when you make a switch? Did you have to put a lot of effort? and focus on what you're going to do next. Alex? Um, I think, yeah, so I don't think meaningful outcomes come easily to anybody. Um, so I think by all means, yes, uh, a, lot of, a lot of effort is taken into any impactful change. Mm. Mm, I think the, there's a paradigm shift a little bit or a, a change of perception when you really desire something then uh, I think the effort that you put in is not as difficult to swallow and it comes naturally so you know going back to the to the quote that you said um, between talent and persistence um, what it makes me think of is I don't know if you guys have seen this movie um, the founder with Michael Keaton um, so it's a very good movie, by the way, I recommend it to everybody. Uh, and he keeps repeating to himself, you know, persistence, 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 that's what makes uh, success. And I think it's true in a career setting, um, but I don't think it's necessarily healthy if you apply it everywhere. I mean, uh, okay. you know, perhaps you shouldn't be really persistent in a, you know, in other situations in your life, but uh, <laughs> career is certainly one. So, um, uh, and the other thing is that I, I think um, this experience gives us talks back at us um, in terms of, you know, we learn from the things that work out or don't work out. So we really shouldn't ignore them just in, a, in, in, in for the sake of being persistent, but kind of adapt and maybe, um, you know, this famous term of uh, iterate or pivot uh, wherever we have to. So um, that's mm -hmm. kind of the way yeah. I see it. Yeah. Um, Stiliana, did you have to put, the, I guess, uh, did you sleep when you were turning from a civil engineer to a, a data processing, or I'm sorry, data analytics engineer? Well, actually not very much, because in the beginning I was still uh, working as a civil engineer and I was taking the courses, so almost, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry, we just weren't seeing you. <laughs> okay. So I was working in the day, uh, learning in the evening and in the holidays. I had almost no free time. Uh, it was uh, really a great effort, but uh, it paid off. <laughs> Did you do a lot of sleep and uh, 
In, in the beginning. Not so much coffee when well, you were... <laughs> well, I, I'm drinking a lot of coffee even now, but uh, yeah, uh, at the beginning, it's it's quite difficult to get to know uh, the company and uh, what uh, your job uh, would, will would, uh, would look like. Because during the, the interviews and uh, the initial process of entering the company, uh, there are a few weeks or months when you're not 100% what are you going to do here. And uh, it's very, very important to have a good onboarding process, in my opinion. Mm. And uh, yeah, and b getting back to the quote, uh, talent versus, versus perseverance, uh, I think it won't hurt to have talent, but with extra efforts and willing to, to achieve your goals, you can catch up and even be the most talented, talented person. And it won't hurt if you have both, if you're talented, if you want to, to develop yourself as well. Mm. Um, Svetlio, what have you observed? So when you have passion, uh, perseverance comes naturally, said Alex. Would you agree? Yes, I agree because uh, if you have passion, you will do everything. Uh, if you want to change your job and your profession, you need to put a lot of effort. Uh, but if you like this thing, you will do it with ease because uh, you are happy to do it again and again and again. And if it's not the right job for you, you will um, come some day and say, oh, again, I need to do this. I need to study. Oh, I don't like it. I have a true uh, interesting case from uh, my, my cousin. Uh, one day signed up for my programming courses, one of these thousands and thousands of people. And he started uh, programming. Uh, he was uh, found he's a good problem solver. He's writing code very well. And I was sure he will become a software engineer because like all, all the others. But one day he came and see, he, he told me, hey, I cannot understand how you and your colleagues stay on this chair all the day. I can't do this. I can't solve these problems. Coding is not a problem for me, but I need to talk to people. I need to talk. I cannot stay here closed in the room. It's not for me. And he escaped. <laughs> Naturally. This is a true story from and uh, he a wasted talent as a developer, right? <laughs> uh, yes, yes. I, I, so I, I told him just learn some development and become a sales or marketing or something where you will work with people. And he, he now again works with sales. Okay. He's a sales guy <laughs> internally. This is his passion. Well, you mentioned that before that, uh, I mean, it's considered believed, probably statistics, statistics show it too, that uh, IT professionals get uh, higher pay compared to other sectors, not only in Bulgaria, but almost anywhere in the world. Um, so how important uh, was the financial aspect to you uh, when you were considering the reinventing your career, Christo? Well, I, I doubt that uh, the financial aspect isn't of any importance at all for anyone. It's, it's important and uh, it depends on the... It, it's quite subjective because for, for some um, money can be liberating and uh, you have uh, more time maybe and be feel more relaxed, have uh, extra, extra time to think about uh, other things apart from your work day and tasks. Well, uh, there are people that are in the opposite. They are looking only, uh, are focused only in the money and uh, this aspect. And this is a never ending chase. So maybe one should find the balance, but it's not just the financial aspect that uh, could lead to change in career path. And speaking of the IT sector, uh, well, flexibility is another thing uh, because it, it's great to have the opportunity to work remotely, for example. Yeah, and let's, let's, okay. let's stick with the financial part. I want to talk about money now. I mean, other perks there. Yeah, I know I'm familiar with them. We talked about it in the first event of Talent Talks. Stiliana, what about you? Um, was uh, the financial aspect uh, a factor in your decision to become a, a, a tech woman? <laughs> well, of course they are. 
Uh, they are, they always are, but uh, they are not the most important thing. Uh, but uh, anyone should consider it uh, as an advantage because uh, switching your career uh, leads you to a new salary. Uh, if this uh, new salary cannot uh, grant you the lifestyle you are having, uh, it might be a problem. Uh, for example, if you uh, get uh, enough money for food and uh, for rent and for bills and uh, everything else, and in the next time you don't have that money, that might be a problem. So uh, considering the salary was one of the factors for a career switch. Uh, although for me, most important thing was not uh, the highest salary because I was aware that when I start uh, I will be a junior with uh, little knowledge and no experience I will not get a high salary uh, but the most important thing for me was that uh, um, I will have uh, a lot more benefits I will have uh, uh, and as here I'm going to interrupt you as well because uh, there are no, a lot of but, but I wanted to talk a bit more about how important is the financial aspect when you when you pick a new career and uh, my next question goes exactly to a point that uh, you also mentioned before that so if you have to decide between a higher pay and an employer who is ready to invest in your training, your uh, upskilling, um, what would you choose? Salary or knowledge, learning? Risto? I think these two are hound, uh, strongly bound, but I'll go with the employer who is willing to invest in me because um, you will gain new knowledge, you will gain new skills, and this, after all, will be beneficial not only for you, but for your employer as well. And you will, from this point, develop even broader horizons of, of your job. And uh, this logically, at least for me, uh, links to um, the higher salary that you're going to get in future, staying with this employer or uh, another one. But, yeah. I'll, I'll go with the the one who will, which who will with invest knowledge in me. and learning because this is an investment and mm. you can write the return of investment on a later point. Uh, Stiliana, how was it for you? I cannot agree more with him because for me, uh, choosing an employer that will invest in me, it's actually a double win. <laughs> Because uh, uh, when uh, I learn more, when I develop, when I upgrade, I will respectfully get the higher salary too. So it is, it is a double win, <laughs> actually. It's, it's, it's a win-win situation. <laughs> so it's a double win. And how is it uh, in a startup, Alex? I mean, you're more on the side of the employer. Um, how much do you uh, stress on giving the right training to people who join the company? Because I'm, I, I mean, I can imagine that as a startup, you cannot really afford to have. Mm, you'd, you'd be you'd be surprised, actually. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, because on the flip side, uh, yes, we can't really afford to send someone to a university and uh, you know do an MBA and pay for their program. But um, you know, things change so quickly that if these people don't have a way of growing, then they're going to be just stalling the progress of the company. And then we're going to have to, every 6 to 12 uh, or 15 months, we're going to have to be hiring new people and then replacing the old ones. And actually, we tested this this year. So um, when we acquired this other company, we took over a completely foreign code base, uh, different products, uh, everything, the, inf the entire infrastructure was completely different. Nobody had, a lot of the engineers had never even worked with their tech stack. And, um, you know, some of the um, more junior people on the team just completely rebuilt the whole thing within a matter of a couple of, a couple of weeks, um, which is absolutely phenomenal. And, I, and, and this is, you know, kudos to our technical director because he pretty much, establish this culture of, you know, buy the books you need, you know, you know, take the, the time you need to, you know, just uh, play around with something, read about, uh, you know, new technologies and what's out there. Um, you know, just this is this is one way for us that's, you know, that has paid out. Um, as for me personally, I um, I would also go for the uh, for the training, but it really depends on the type of organization, you know, if 
a lot of organizations today speculate with the fact that you know it's a great environment to learn and grow when in reality it's just a you know it's just a way to squeeze squeeze out more out of you so you have to be really nimble and really cautious about um, who is the the employer that is promising that in the first place I think earlier stage companies by default create that environment because they grow and you can just accelerate really quickly with them um, and then there are companies that you know will just tell you okay do this course so we can offload that onto on top of you as well so that doesn't really make you more qualified it just increases you know the things that you can do which are very specific in that particular environment so it doesn't really grow you as an individual so i think there's a bit of a distinction but um overall yeah i think uh, i also share you guys' uh, mm -hmm. uh view that uh, tra you know training and growth and learning um, is a lifelong experience so companies that understand that typically i think tend to do better mm. yeah Svetlio, how is it with your students do they get it i mean uh, what is, what is the percentage uh, of the of the of the people who would like to go into a career in it and and tech who are doing it because of the higher pay Usually people who come for money in the IT industry are not quite successful because they don't have this internal passion which uh, tells them to uh, stay after work and to earn, to earn in the weekends because uh, many companies measure the experience by years. It's not the correct measure. You don't measure by hours spent in working, but it depends on which projects you have worked and what you have done out of work because really good developers uh, they work side projects after work in the weekends as freelancers additionally and they uh, sign up for additional trainings and courses and they constantly upgrade their skills so but it depends uh, on whether you, you choose salary or a place where y the company improves your skills because if you are in condition where you just need money you, the other option is unavailable. For example, I, I often have students who have uh, mm, uh, at 40 years plus and they have three child children and uh, they have a one uh, credit uh, with the bank so they cannot stay for long and they tell me hey please uh, tell me how to become a software developer for six months because uh, I have a budget for six months and after that my uh, wife will fire me and will change me for another uh, more more successful husband uh, <laughs> just kidding but <laughs> something like this happens but it depends so in the beginning of your career you definitely need to learn uh, I, I give uh, advices to my students for their first jobs to don't to to don't mention money at all at the interviews at this because it's not important. It's important to get experience. They will have second job. <laughs> In these days, it's unlike highly unlikely to to have only one job like our uh, grand for twenty parents. years. Yeah, yeah. For okay, 20. you mean okay? Yeah, true. That's true. Um, <coughs> how many IT professionals would you say we need uh, to, to meet the demand on the local market, job market? <laughs> how, much, how many more? Infinite. <laughs> 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 but but to, to be more precise, uh, we are part of the global economy. In the global e economy, the IT industry grows because uh, everything is becoming digital now. Especially this pandemic uh, even makes this faster and faster. So our life is becoming more more technical uh, and technical in, in even untraditional sectors like medicine, like agriculture, etc. So uh, this is growing exponentially so uh, if we have if the entire country works as software engineers and IT professionals it will not be enough <laughs> if everyone is involved because if we have enough people more companies will learn this and will come and open offices and there will be demand so if we for example, mm, educate more people to fill this gap, more, con more companies will come from the others uh, mm -hmm. places of the world and this 
cannot stop. This will stop when uh, this industry start stops uh, running, ex growing exponentially. I don't know how and when this will happen. I don't believe this will be in my life. Mm. But so there is also another trend. So we have automation and AI and machine learning, and it's said that it makes. Um, it's considered that it makes uh, developers or people who code kind of obsolete. No. Um, no? I don't believe in this. You don't believe this in that? These are okay. the AI bullshits. Okay, this is... I like that. Thank be you. Be <laughs> because because th this has happened many times before. When horses were changed with cars, uh, what happened to, to the horsemen? They needed to get new skills and become, become uh, car engineers. So this happens again and again and again. Because people say, okay, what will happen when the factories replace the people with robots? We can see this, this works in Japan, in Korea. It, this is not something new. So this has happened in the past for many times. Now the speed is a little bit faster, but it will not happen, the replacement uh, of the mm, standard workers with robots will not happen for just one year or six months. It will happen for 30, 50 years. For example, I, I don't believe that taxi drivers will disappear soon. They will become disappearing slightly, 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 uh, because even now we have horsemen. It's not so, so massive like I don't know I whether this is the English word, konyar, <laughs> but <laughs> people who care for the horses and uh, even and now we have them, but it's not such a big portion. So this will happen naturally. Young people will become, uh, will choose more technical jobs because this is their, mm, re uh, this is the moment now. In the next years, they may choose uh, space-related jobs where people will live in other planets. And this will happen at the, with the more and more with the young people. Like, for example, uh, now a uh, car engineer is a person with a laptop. <laughs> in the past, car engineer was a person with uh, these <coughs> things. It changes in the future, car engineer maybe will be someone who has a joystick. <laughs> and uh, the same like is for surgeons. soldiers. Like soldiers are with the joystick. They don't go at the battlefield. Hey, even surgeons Not have joysticks it's now. Slightly, it's yeah. a transition, but this is the direction. And it's uh, actually considered also a transition that is happening ever faster. So um, mm -hmm. there, is a, there is this uh, uh, word uh, that we live now in a knowledge society. So uh, one of the most important capitals that we have is actually knowledge. So in the middle of this fast-paced industrial revolution that uh, you've been explaining in very um, picture-like uh, words, I liked it a lot, learning becomes critical uh, if you want to stay con competitive on the job market. So how much of your daily life is committed to learning and uh, upskilling? Christo? Well, I'm trying... Like in hours. <laughs> I, I'm trying to learn something new every day. And it depends on the day and the workload. Sometimes it's a few minutes, sometimes it's a couple of hours. But I'm constantly trying to, to get new skills because, as it was, was mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we're living in such times when um, it's quite usual to, to change your career path or your career journey. And it was quite uh, normal a few decades ago to, to stick on the same position for your whole life. Now the situation has changed and there are researchers that uh, on average men will um, have five plus jobs during his life. So it's very important to, to gain new skills, to gain new knowledge because um, it's like doing a puzzle. It's uh, beneficial to, to have more information and more knowledge because you don't know when you're going to need it and every new skill and knowledge counts. Mm, okay, yes, that's true. Also, it's very dynamic. Uh, you don't know where you're going to end up. Uh, Alex, how much 
time do you spend in learning and upskilling? I mean, uh, I'm, yes, I'm not sure I've not kept, training others. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I've kept track, but uh, I think just by virtue of um, you know of the things that I have to do, um, or us as a team that we have to do, is a very big portion of it is just you know we have we have to figure out how to do this. Nobody really knows how this is done. We can't we don't have the time or the resources to go and find somebody. So we're going to do our best to figure this out. We're going to. You know, luckily we have a network of pretty smart people around us uh, who have either done it or know somebody who has done it in the past. Uh, and um, we reach out to them and we try to um, to understand, you know, how is this done? Um, be it, you know, a, a deal, be it, um, you know, something, a, a technical challenge or a marketing challenge or just a strategic question. Um, so all of those things I view as you know, assets that we acquire and we know and make us smarter on how to proceed further. So mm -hmm. in terms of more tangible skills, I guess, almost on a daily basis, I mean, uh, you know, we we do look at a lot of things uh, and things do change. And in our case, for instance, it was um, our industry almost died and we became obsolete overnight. So, um, you know, we've never experienced anything like that. So now we, how do we, start selling other stuff to the same people that we haven't done in the past. So that's a, an entirely new learning experience from all, all kinds of things, from setting up a new entity in the U.S. which is going to have an agency agreement with their old company and how do we do that? So how do we do that from a legal standpoint? How do we open a new Stripe account which is going to be serving this new entity only spe specifically for this new business? And you know, this is just one example, so... Uh, Ooh, yeah, that's tough, that's tough. Yeah. Um, Stiliana? How much of your time is uh, devoted to learning uh, new skills and uh, acquiring new skills and learning new stuff? Well, fortunately, lately, not so much. Uh, since I have a little child home and uh, she's taking almost all my time. But uh, I want to mention something that uh, everyone have, has faced. Um, during uh, our daily work, uh, everyone is learning, even though uh, he or she did not see it at first place, but everyone is facing some problems that uh, um, cannot be initially resolved. Uh, so tries uh, different cases, searching for different options, uh, exploring different technolo technologies just to resolve the problem. So uh, for me, uh, my work is also kind of learning because uh, uh, this is I'm sorry, because this is uh, the place where uh, you practice and uh, you practice and train and in this case you learn. And the most important things for me are uh, the people I work with uh, because for me it is very important part the knowledge sharing. Uh, you can learn a lot from your colleagues if they are willingly to share, of course, their knowledge. Uh, but uh, if you find such a people, it is really, really easy to learn new stuff uh, because uh, these are people who can um, share their knowledge, their experience, uh, um, show you uh, complex cases and uh, show you different examples uh, to uh, view better. So for me, learning is uh, almost every day, all the day. You can always uh, put yourself in a situation that you can learn something new. Oh, I'm sure that you're learning a lot uh, in with your baby right now as well, which is, uh, uh, I think, uh, knowledge that is not too yes. underestimated. Fortunately, I can use this knowledge <laughs> in my career. Oh, I'm, I'm actually I can because. Um, you learn to do things under the pressure of wow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, which kind of brings me to my last question, and then uh, we will check uh, the tougher ones, which are coming from the audience, um, about relationships, something that you have already mentioned. Um, so right now in the pandemia, uh, due to the, to the um, health uh, and economic crisis, uh, many of us are still in remote mode. 
which makes this social interaction and this social relating quite uh, difficult. So I can imagine that for a lot of people, um, for, 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 for whom the social aspect of their job was important, like, I need to talk to people, as you mentioned that <laughs> before, um, is now, you know, losing its, uh, its power. And uh, we need to focus a bit more on do we enjoy our job for what we're doing, uh, if it's coding or migrating databases, or in my case, uh, I don't know, writing concepts for, uh, for, for customers, for marketing campaigns. Um, you really need to be enjoying this in order to pursue to to, uh, to stay with your career because the social part is uh, is kind of broken right now. So, um, would you say that uh, the meaning of purpose and uh, working for a purpose-driven uh, company is now becoming more important than ever, Svetlio? Yes, I believe this is a trend I see. Uh, in the early days after the sociali socialism, it, it was not like this. It was, oh, I need money, I need to do something, I need to do something which is not allowed, the lavera, like we say in Bulgarian. <laughs> uh, next, people changed a little bit. They needed to, to make something which is to work for a good company, for a good brand. And now recently, recently the, mm, they want to do something which has a meaning, which has a purpose, which have a cause, which uh, is significant, which is meaningful. So, so I see it, yes, there, there is a trend. And I think it's not only in Bulgaria, it is just uh, maybe trend of the generations, they say that uh, the X, Y, Z generations are different, they are motivated by different things. Um, yes, it's it's true. Mm -hmm. How do you see it? I mean, I think uh, in the in the startup sector we talk a lot about the purpose and the transformation. How do you, how do you, how do you call it? Like uh, mission, actually. Mission driven. Yes, <laughs> a purposeful mission. Uh, you know, to be totally fair, I I'm not really sure what what is meant by mission driven. I mean, do. I think by default every company is mission driven, right? So if there's no mission, like it's it's a, it's a, just a social gathering. So <laughs> I think uh, um, you know I think that's definitely there. But I I think there's also a lot of misconception uh, around you know what is the purpose of a company, and there's a lot of I I think you know through no fault of their own, but uh, you know some of the generations that we mentioned, you know X and Y and Z. Uh, <laughs> We're not talking about <laughs> chromosomes here. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> um, you know, kind of dilute things of uh, ha just having fun at work and having a you know a purpose at work. Those are completely different things. And uh, I think work is something serious and should be taken responsibly and seriously. Um, and if you know, if if somebody comes with an expectation that they're just going to have a really good time at work, that's probably not a, not a very good sign. Um, I don't think that things are necessarily exclusive, uh, but you know, I personally would look at even the employer. If I was to you know uh, apply for a job, I would like to sense that you know, if 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 we're talking about a purpose, then specifically, what is that purpose? And that purpose should really come across as something serious. It's not about you know the fact that we have bean bags in the office and we have a snack bar and you know we have beer so you can have a beer at lunch at your workplace and it makes it really cool and you know that's not what constitutes a company um, you know the, the whole reason why this entire setting exists is because the company is probably doing something right and most of the time it's doing money or it's solving a big problem um, and I think you know that's the surface but underneath the surface that's where the real issue is and, um, and the, the big you know, the, the big thing is happening behind the curtain. So um, I think, you know, you can r sense when a company is doing this and when the people behind it are really close to that mission. So um, that's kind of how... Um, Thank you for this say. point. I mean, uh, that is a great distinction, fun and mission and purpose-driven. I think... Uh, the X wires and the the Zers, Zers, and so the generation Y and and the, the generation Z, they also somehow maybe sometimes have an unrealistic expectation about how much fun 
uh, work should uh, be should be making and how much responsibility corresponds to this uh, uh, to yeah. this fund. I, and yeah. I don't know where, where this whole thing came from and why it's specifically attached to the IT, but if you want to have, uh, you know, a mission or a purpose, look at doctors, especially now, you know, who's making more of a difference or has a mission-driven job than people in the front line? I don't, I don't see them talking about, you know, it's, it's, it's great, it's so much fun, but, you know, let's face it, this is the people that are making the, you know, the most of an impact, but somehow people are not really uh, when they talk and they, they envision this mission-driven company or, or, or a job, that's not specifically what they, what they see. They see, you know, I'm, I'm going to be in marketing or I'm going to be a, a coder for the startup that does filters for selfies, for example. And it's, you know, it's not, oh, I'm not saying that this is how everybody's viewing it, but there's certainly an element of this that I've seen. Thank you. Christo? Uh, for me, it's always been important to to like what you are doing but um, actually f from my point of view it's becoming more and more important to be part of these uh, purpose-driven companies and to have a cause because um, you spend a great part of your day and your life uh, doing some jobs and uh, working on some projects and in the end of the day if you don't like what you achieved then this results in mental burden I would say and uh, you just don't feel good enough and uh, it is um, part of the uh, this could cause um, burnout and it's really really important to, to like what are you doing and to know that it's beneficial for your clients or for some people that you're making their life better and uh, this will give you extra force to to avoid this danger of uh, Burnout, for example. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so luckily for for Stiliana, she enjoys her work, and uh, she is now currently working mostly remotely. So I don't think uh, I think maybe we know the the answer to, to this <laughs> question with you. <laughs> yes, although you yes. don't probably have the you know the physical social contacts with your colleagues right now, which I'm sure that you probably miss. Uh, uh, actually, I haven't seen my colleagues, uh, some of them for nine months, uh, some of them I have never met. Uh, <laughs> recently, <laughs> recently, a new colleagues joined the company and uh, I have seen them only on camera, of course, uh, but it is not the same. Uh, the personal contact uh, for me, it's uh, really important because uh, um, it connects people, it makes people more close. In and for me, it is good to have it. Uh, now I am more close with the people that uh, I knew before, the people I have met. Um, of course, uh, I work with uh, the new colleagues. Uh, I communicate them. I, I help them. Everything is uh, much the same. Uh, but this uh, tiny difference that is... Um, uh, the person, uh, the personal matter, um, you cannot uh, at least um, talk as a, as a friend with uh, these people who, who have never met in, in face. Um, of course, I, I hope uh, this will change soon and I will meet these people. Uh, but for now, unfortunately, the situation is this, that uh, the only way to see and communicate with them is online. Mm. I've just checked the questions from the audience and there uh, there are um, several. I hope that we will manage to answer them all. Uh, the first one goes to Dr. Nakov. <laughs> uh, what can you do tomorrow if you want to find your real passion? If I want to find my passion, I will try different things. In fact, I had uh, I have periods of time uh, in my life where I have a lot of passion and periods where I have less because uh, I'm very good when I'm starting something, when I'm building something new, when I need to be fast to be to learn the others how to do things. But when I achieve the goal, the passion slightly re reduces and this is normal with maybe most of the people so I need either find a new passion or just uh, 
think how to mm, to change the requirements and to to not not to feel myself like I I have reached the destination. For example, I, uh, at the start I wanted to to build the biggest uh, place where people can work technology, and this happened. But now I uh, in, increase the same thing, but for the entire world, not just Bulgaria, because uh, it's a new a new passion. So I I think people should try. Trying is it's my recipe. Mm. Try, 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 and you will fee feel what is for you and what so is. So, if it happened tonight that you feel like you have no passion for what you're doing, which I doubt, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure, uh, and uh, you had to do something tomorrow, what will you do? It it will it will find me. It will find mm, you. Yeah, okay. I, I will take a bottle of rakia yeah? first, <laughs> <laughs> just to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and just to get inspired <laughs> after the, <laughs> the hangover. in the evening <laughs> after the hangover yeah in the evening you will know what to do okay that's a good recipe i like it yeah. <laughs> um okay the do you think it is important to have uh having a mentor when you're switching careers and who was yours and the best advice they gave you uh that's a question that goes to all Maybe we can start with Stiliana. Did you have an, a mentor when you switched to data analytics? Uh, yes, I kind of have. Uh, it was my one of my colleagues slash friend. <laughs> uh, and he was one of the seniors in the company. Uh, he he was not positioned uh, as a, my mentor, but uh, actually he he was. Uh, he gave me some uh, very good advices that uh, uh, I should not uh, give up when I see difficulties. Uh, that I should uh, try constantly to uh, to develop and uh, to gain more knowledge and uh, to be um, more and more and and better. Uh, so uh, yes, I had uh, this kind of a mentor. Uh, he helped me a lot uh, in my difficult moments. Uh, he helped me actually in my not so difficult moments uh, for he provided me a very good knowledge background. Uh, it is good to have it. It is easier to have it. Uh, I don't think it is necessary to have it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Christo, did you, have a man uh, did you have a mentor? Yes, yes. Uh, I had a dedicated mentor once I entered Dokumaster. Uh, his name is Metodi. And uh, it, uh, it's very beneficial to have a mentor. Uh, when even w and uh, if he's good enough, and that's the case, it's, uh, it's great to, to have uh, support like this. His best piece of, of, of advice to you was? Well, um, maybe not piece of advice but encouraging to to stay on track and saying that you are doing better and that keeps motivates you okay someone telling you that you're improving that's good uh Svetlana, alex you're actually both mentors so you also know it from the other side so i'm not going to ask you if you, you know a mentor is important when you're entering something risky or a new career i guess the answer is yes <laughs> um but what is the best piece of advice that uh, your mentors gave to you? Um, this is um, with regards of the career change or just in general? I think uh, within the career change, yes. Um, I think it's just learning to let go and understand that nothing is really, you know, Nothing is irreversible from that standpoint. I mean, I think Sveta talked about this uh, a lot, and I think it's a very, very good point that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not a big deal. You try a couple of things, and uh, especially if you're young, because you have that luxury of just being by yourself, and nobody else is really relying on you uh, but yourself. Um, so it's really sad to see somebody selling, you know, their best years for, like, 
you know, a couple thousand um, euros or levas, whatever, a month if they're not sure that this is their vocation. Instead of trying, you know, trying a bunch of things and then failing at all of them, but at the end of the day, you walk away with all of those things that I tried and I've met so many people, I've tried so many different things, I have discovered myself better, maybe I found something new, maybe I didn't. So that advice of, um, you know, don't worry, um, you know, one of the things that when um, we were speaking to our very, very first investors um, at 500 startups, um, during the first call, they said, you guys are too early, so sorry, you know, uh, it's not going to work. And we said, that's totally fine. You know, we're going to just keep doing what we're doing. And then two weeks later, we had a second call with them. And they said, you're still too early, but we really like you. So it might not be this company. You might fail. It might not be the second company. It might fail. But maybe down the road, the third or fourth company is going to work out. So, you know, that, that sense of encouragement uh, that it's okay if it doesn't work out was a big thing for us because it kind of took away the, the stress of, okay, now, if they're okay that they're, uh, you know, that we fail and lose all their money, then we, we should also be somewhat okay with that. So, I think this is a topic that we definitely need to talk a bit more about in Bulgaria, failing, that it's not a big thing, that it's something that uh, you can actually learn immensely from. Uh, your best piece of advice or uh, the advice that you got from your mentor the best In one. most cases, I don't have mentor. Uh, I have had mentor f only for a few years uh, when I was in working in a big company. In all the other of, of time, I, I'm just the, the person who is supposed to, to be a, the mentor. And <laughs> so what uh, is but, but, but yeah. maybe... May, may you then you can share your best piece of advice the, as a the mentor. The best piece of advice was that if you put enough time and be persistent on doing something, sooner or later you will achieve it. So okay. Just do it, do it, do it, do it. If it doesn't work, change something and do it again on a better way. And finally you will succeed. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> can I so add something? Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> Uh, well, while I was listening, uh, I uh, catch up with something. Um, one of the other advice that I want to give is that it is never too late to change your career. Uh, this was uh, blocking me for some time before I make the change because I said, oh, I'm too old. Um, there is no time to learn new stuff. There is no time uh, for making uh, new uh, careers, etc. Uh, it is not too late. If you're breathing, it's not late. As long as you're alive, it's not late. This is my advice. So oh. Line up for soft uni. <laughs> <laughs> that's great or that's become a painter or <laughs> <laughs> why only the tech industry where, where your passion is leading you okay um there is a question to uh alex from um so claim compass is a niche business idea which was your uh which was bigger motivation the challenge to work in a startup or the duties of a marketing job itself this is from georgi um that's a that's an excellent question. So first of all, uh, I was massively unqualified for a marketing, and I still am, by the way, for the role that I occupy. Um, so I don't view myself as, uh, you know, as a primarily marketing uh, specialist or a practitioner. Um, so at the time, the motivation was that we wanted to solve a particular issue. Um, and it was just funny how it all coincided. I was working, I, I worked for an airline before, and coincidentally just... You know, a couple of weeks before coming across um, the idea, so Tanya, our CEO and co-founder, pitched the idea at me a week after I had my flight uh, delayed and canceled. And I had worked at an airline just sitting right next to the customer support people, and I had no idea that this thing even existed. Um, so it was mostly... Uh, and I have a pet peeve for poor customer service, so I really, you know, you know there was ab no expectation in terms of monetary, uh, you know, anything money, really. It was mostly like, you know, we're almost sure that nothing's going to work. So um, it was mostly around, okay, so we know that this is an issue. Um, you know, what's the best way of solving this? Can we solve it? And that was a drive that we, I think, all three of us shared, and this is one of the 
probably the single most important thing that we, we did right is that we were all at the same level. We were all inter intellectually honest with ourselves in terms of what are we getting ourselves into? What are our expectations? What do we bring on the table? Um, so this mix really made things possible for us. Not so much in terms of, you know, I want to be a, a marketing, uh, you know, a marketing person. Uh, this, this comes later, you know, you, you can be a marketing professional and join a company and then keep growing as a marketer. When you're founding a, um, a startup, uh, you know, it, it's a luxury if you get to a stage where you can really specialize and be a really good uh, marketing person or a really good... I think nowadays it's almost impossible. I mean, media is developing so fast. So even, you know, within if you stop learning in three months, you don't know what is happening anymore and you don't know how oh, yeah. to do marketing, uh, digital marketing. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen majored in history and gave himself five years to turn uh, performing into a career. Do the panelists have a similar approach to the process? What was your process for adapting and becoming more confident in your new field? Five years? Okay, that's a lot. Hmm. Christo, how much time did you give yourself? Well, <coughs> from the legal point of view, uh, till my first job in the data, data field, maybe it was a year uh, to feel comfortable, to, to take some um, boot camps, to, to start digging into this uh, material. So I think it's manageable for less than five years. Okay. Svetlo, five years? Is it a five lot? Five years, uh, uh, if you do it uh, as a side job, yes, five years is good time. If Without you, the sleeping if part. If you are motivated <laughs> enough, two years are, are enough. And champions can do it for one year. But these are people who drop everything, who cancel their relationships with the f their friends and uh, <laughs> husbands, and uh, etc. They walk them in the mountains somewhere. Uh, and they quote cold. constantly. <laughs> I, I have seen this, but it's not the massive uh, time. People should spend two years on average. Five are too much if you do it uh, like you go to the fitness when you are a software engineer just twice a week or once a week. Yes, it may take 10 years. You know. mm. <laughs> Stiliana, how was it for you, five years? Well, five years, it sounds really, really long time. Uh, actually, it took me about uh, a year, maybe, uh, from the point I started courses till the point of my first job. Uh, I cannot say that uh, starting my uh, first job uh, at the, this time as I was very qualified, uh, uh, so I cannot estimate uh, how, uh, which one was exactly the point when uh, I ever uh, I uh, uh, finished, uh, no, no finished, but uh, um, reached. Uh, some middle level. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, in these five years he means only uh, the learning or uh, learning and uh, upgrading, but uh, I think that this is too much, really. But uh, some uh, things must be taken uh, uh, as if uh, this was um, his full-time commitment or just uh, an hour a day or an hour a week. Uh, if you take it an hour a week, it may take not five, but 10 years, maybe. <laughs> so um, I think uh, um, it, uh, it depends. It really depends. So it depends on, on how much you commit on it. So you can become a averagely good programmer or coder in two years. When it comes to marketing, it's, you know, it takes learning all the time so five years would not be enough yeah to to have this process uh, well i think marketing is extremely broad so it really depends on the industry that you're in it really depends on uh 
um, you know, the company uh, that you're that you're in. It, it includes, you know, even just specializing into performance marketing and just, you know, working on specifically on only Facebook ads and only Facebook placement, not even Instagram and all the other channels that exist is a, you know, is easily a full-time job that you can be doing for years, especially, you know, what we're seeing now. So, um, you know, to get started, uh, you can, you can probably start within, within a year and, and get pretty good. Um, but to build a career, uh, you, I think you really need to have a plan of where you're going. There's this thing, um, and whoever's interested in marketing, I do encourage them to think of it in, term, in terms of a T-shaped marketer. So you have all of those different things that a marketer does. So they do content and SEO and landing pages and copywriting and you know paid media and they do PR and all of this is marketing, right? Mm. But there's one thing that you, you want to focus a little bit more. So it looks like T. So, for example, you're really good in content and copywriting, so this is going to be your, your tail, and then you're going to have a little bit of knowledge in, in all of these other things. But I think it's impossible to bring this only one thing to the table. So uh, a lot of people make the, that mistake of thinking, you know, I'm going to go into marketing and I'm just going to be a marketer. And then, but, but, but what does that mean exactly? You know, there's, there's so many different things that, that, you know, that go with this, so... Uh, so it's a, I, I think it's a lifelong journey, just like with anything else, even with, uh, you know, with programming. It's not like, okay, now I'm a programmer for life. Well, things change, technologies evolve, and so you have to keep, keep up with everything. So, uh, and, you know, you can be a full-stack developer. You can be front-end. You can be back-end. You can be, you know, this particular set of languages or something really exotic. So, again, I think in, in all of these, in the world that we're in, especially in tech, it's a... Uh, you sign up for a, like a lifelong university, um, which happens to pay pretty well too. So, mm -hmm. a never-ending journey. Yeah. Yes, Svetlo, I, I saw that you're smiling. Um, I mean, I guess you've been talking to uh, oh, no, future no. marketers as well. No, okay. I thought that you maybe have something to add. Okay, that's uh, also an interesting question. Can anyone provide uh, a perspective on how employers can support the ongoing personal growth of their employees? Can you give examples of any structured programs that uh, you've seen work well? I'm not going to ask Svetli this time. <laughs> um, this highly depends on the companies. Mm -hmm. Some, some pumpin, companies are doing this formally. Some companies are doing this uh, because they don't have other ways. Uh, for example, I, I agree that uh, with startups, you have a faster growth uh, path. Because at the startups, there is no dedicated role. You, you should do many, many roles in the same time, as, and you need to learn faster. Some corporations, they have some guidelines, they hire trainers, they t tell you, you need to sign up for two careers trainings this year and five the next year, uh, so you need to sign up here what you have passed. I, I think th this should come internally from you. If you don't want to learn more uh, at this job, this means that this job is not for you. If you are not motivated to, to learn more and more and to become more skillful at your workplace, this is not your workplace. You should change it. Mm -hmm. Stiliana, how did you experience that? Did you see um, uh, yeah, a successful best practices uh, from the side of the employer? Because you mentioned in the beginning that they supported you in this uh, critical step, becoming a data analytics engineer. What was good about the program? Yes, they have supported me. Uh, they have provided me a lot of online trainings. Uh, but uh, as Svetlana said, uh, they, uh, it, it was up to me. Uh, I chose uh, which courses to follow and which steps to follow. There was no pressure from the side of the employer. Uh, you should learn this and this and this because, um, for example, we need such uh, employees. Uh, no, it was based on uh, what I want to learn, uh, on what, uh, on where I want to develop. It was uh, um, almost everything was up to my decision. And I think this is the way uh, it should be for um, 
everyone knows himself the best, knows which are uh, his strong uh, and weak sides, uh, knows uh, which one, um, which thing he'll find interesting uh, and where is the passion. Uh, so uh, I'm glad I had this, this opportunity. Uh, actually, I had the opportunity to um, explore different fields before I uh, find that uh, my place is in the data department. Uh, so I think uh, and this, uh, this opportunity must be given to people uh, to explore and to learn things that uh, they enjoy, they find interesting, uh, because in this uh, case, uh, the progress will be faster. When you learn something you find interesting, uh, you will always find the time for, for learning. Okay. Uh, Christo, what was your experience with structured career development programs? So, uh, can you mention best practices that uh, are really good? Yeah, as, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, when you're entering a new field and a new company, the the basic one, the the fundamental one, is very good uh, onboarding process because even if you use the technology in your previous uh, jobs, uh, you should have the concept of the business and it would be provided this way. And then, uh, as uh, Svetlu mentioned, it's very important to, to dig into the details, but this um, willingness should come from oneself. But uh, it, it's very, for me, successful to have these uh, hybrid uh, trainings. Uh, on one hand, from the other teams or your teams or your team, and uh, they could be mixed with some internal trainings uh, that will give you broader perspective and some new knowledges. Mm. That's the final question, which is also an interesting perspective. Of all the problems in the world, why did you choose to focus exactly on the problems that you're solving right now in, your, in the companies that you're working with or at? And any advice how to find problems to solve? <laughs> Alex, I'm going to ask you first because I believe that problem solving is in the very core of what you're doing with Claim Compass. Yeah, I think the honest answer is, it's a mix of uh, it's a mix of luck, timing, um, background, and drive. I would be lying if I said that you know I was losing sleep over the late flights. That's not true. Um, but it just so happened that I met other people that really cared about that. It so happened that you know I knew we knew collectively brought something to the table which made sense to to start what we're doing. Um, I'm by no means advocating that we're the best people to solve that issue. Uh, there's probably some somebody else out there that probably knows a lot more and could do a, a much better job. The only difference is that we're doing it and you know they might be doing something else. So at the end of the day, um, I think you know finding problems to solve is looking at uh, just changing your mindset a little bit and looking, exploring a lot, uh, around yourself and thinking, well, what are some of the things that don't really make sense to me and don't make sense to other people that I would like to improve or that I think that might be, might be better for them or for myself? Um, and then trying to, you know, to get some insights into that, talking to people and... Uh, you know, we're going to get into this whole semantics of validating and, you know, and, you know, MVPs and all that. That's not my point. The point is just, you know, try to think of you're not a victim of your environment. Like you, you can actually shape your environment. I think this is the most important takeaway is that, you know, there's plenty of problems. They don't, they don't specifically need to come dressed as a massive problem that needs solving. It could be just something small, but that people will still care for it. You know, they're not going to lose sleep over it, but they will still care. They will still be interested into experiencing, you know, your solution or trying it out. And that's a, that's a pretty good start. Mm. Svetlo, how did you find uh, your problem that you're My solving? My approach is always try and you will feel whether this is for you or not. But I, I'm not sure this will work for everyone. Some people uh, have more scientific approaches 
like uh, follow the hot trends, follow the, or for example, if you are in Bulgaria, just follow the uh, well-developed countries, what happens there, it will come here in five years. So in, in, in terms of technology, in, if, if in the UK they talk about, for example, uh, renewable energy, five years later it will come in Bulgaria. So it's quite easy. If you want to inu innovate on a larger scale, on the, this scale. might not work. So mm, I also think that there is uh, a lot of chance, a lot of um, something which is not planned. I have never uh, dreamed to be entrepreneur. I even thought that this is something not, not interesting, not um, good, but I wanted to be a teacher and the only way to become a teacher for a software engineer uh, it was to become an entrepreneur because I tried all the universities uh, and it didn't <laughs> happen. I, 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 I have worked in Sofia University, Technical University of Software, New Bulgarian <laughs> University and it, I found they are working uh, incorrectly. The, the, the way they do it, it's not right so you shape so i your needed to, to to reshape it and later i found that this is called entrepreneurship <laughs> i didn't know uh, for example the first day i, I started uh, making marketing i didn't know this word i just put uh, ads in the forums Th this was before the facebook and this shits uh, modern uh, I just put the advertisements even on a paper on the uh, on the street. Yeah. Come and uh, learn programming, Pat. And people came. <laughs> Later, I found that this was a marketing, <laughs> and there is some marketing uh, um, funnel and other terms. I just reinvented them. But I believe there is a better way. You, some people first uh, read books and then they mm, try what they read in the books. I do the opposite. I first try and if I fail with the, my first attempt, I talk with friends because reading books takes too much time. I can always find someone who is more skillful or something than me. For example, if I... I, I, I currently have, again, uh, I need to re find a replacement for YouTube and Vimeo for thousands of videos. So I tried myself and I talked with people <laughs> and they advised me. I compile all the information in, my, in myself and try what they told me and find a way. And so this is the innovation and this is my, my, my place uh, for in my in this company but it's not for everyone mm. um mm. christo as a lawyer you might have solved a lot of problems you also might have created a lot of problems <laughs> 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 just, just a joke. i hope that uh, if we have lawyers in the audience they're not taking it personally uh but how did you pick uh, the problem that you're solving right now with data well uh i will agree with alex that Timing is very important and I, I'm not quite sure even now that I've chosen this problem, but maybe the problem have chosen me because um, it was um, by accident uh, how I saw this uh, ad for this position and just two years ago um, I didn't know that one day I'll migrate legacy systems uh, so yes it's timing can chance uh, at mm. least in my opinion yes Stiliana the last word is uh, yours how did you pick your problem to solve mm, well maybe I will repeat it but <laughs> at this point I think uh, problems find me <laughs> not I found them <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, so it is not up. Uh, it is not up to choice. Uh, uh, I don't pick it up. I uh, just face it and try to resolve it. Someone by my sometimes by myself, uh, sometimes uh, with the help of uh, other people, which I'm very thankful. Uh, but uh, actually, and really, uh, problems found me. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, it's hard to summarize. I mean, there were such great advices here and uh, lines uh, which taught me, okay, I, I thought um, there was a lot of wisdom here. I mean, we, saw, we talked about having the courage. We talked about not being afraid of failure. We talked about how important relationships are. We talked about the value of learning and uh, knowledge. And uh, we also talked about grit, perseverance and how important that is. Um, it seems to me right now that changing careers uh, includes many aspects and it takes a lot. And I hope that we haven't uh, uh, scared off anyone who has been considering reinventing their career uh, at this point. If you have to make it simple, I'm thinking maybe really considering what do you have to lose and um, how important is happiness to you. And uh, if you have to, the, if the one thing is outweighing the other, then you have the answer. And then just jump. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I really hope that you could have taken at least one thing from the discussion. Um, we will be summarizing it uh, and you can read uh, the key takeaways from tonight's uh, in, uh, in uh, I don't know, Etienne? Monday? Okay, on Monday. <laughs> you can hear the, the most important lines from, from tonight's discussion. You can also rewatch it on uh, Facebook and uh, on the YouTube. I encourage you to share it also with your network. I also encourage you to write to Otman, maybe he do you still have uh, five or no? Oh, okay, uh, you will tell me later. Encourage you to write to him and get this personal assessment for free. I did it, it was great. Um, and uh, see you most probably in January, where we'll be talking about managers and developers. Bye-bye. <laughs>